I know that the center works really hard to engage people like yourself, the discussions about environmental health. And I'm really glad to talk to you about how nature can help you be healthier. Uh, my name, as uh, Dr. Hein Damasco said, is uh, Kim Hartley, and I'm a nurse, um, but I'm also a teacher and a scientist. I used to take care of patients as a nurse, uh, but now I research how nature can make people healthier. Um, since I've worked with children and young adults most of my working life, um, these are the people that I really want to help through my research, and I'm particularly interested in how nature can lessen anxiety and depression. Um, I'd love to know more about each of you and your future plans. Um, I'd like to think some of the people here today are future healthcare providers, or maybe even landscape architects, or ecologists, or gardeners, or city planners. Um, each of these has a role um, in impacting how kids can use nature to increase their well being, and so many more. So there's so many different um, spheres of work that can, um, that can help with make, getting kids into nature to be healthier. I want to start by talking about what determines our health. Those factors that are both in our control and sometimes outside of our control can help us be healthier. Those are called determinants of health. And according to Healthy People 2020, which is a list of national health priorities set by the US Department of Health and Human Services, those determinants include um, health behaviors. Those are the decisions you make every day about your own health. So for example, it's the foods you eat, the amount of exercise you get, um, your use of alcohol, tobacco, and drugs, your reproductive health and protection from sexually transmitted diseases. It can be whether, you, whether or not you choose to wear a seatbelt or a helmet um, and your hand washing practices. These are all decisions that you make that has an impact on your own health. Biology and genetics include things that aren't necessarily in your control, like your body type, your gender, your age, your predisposition for disease through genetics inherited by your parents. Those are things that you're born with and, um, and part of your environment that maybe you can't control as much as your health behaviors. Then there are social factors and economic factors that include things like your education, whether or not you're employed, um, your family and the social supports available to you, any language barriers you face, what technology you have available to you, and the neighborhood you live in. Healthcare includes preventative care like vaccinations, access to healthcare providers, and the quality of healthcare available to you in your area, um, how much that care can cost, and whether or not you have health insurance. And lastly is the physical environment that includes um, air and water quality, temperature, challenging weather events like tornadoes and flooding, um, transportation, housing, access to food, healthy food, um, the natural environment around you, the schools in your community, and your exposure to toxic substances like living in um, industrial areas or close to very um, heavily trafficked roads that might have some air quality issues. Of course, these are all connected. And um, if you're interested to learn more about the national health priorities for the next 10 years, those are at health.gov slash healthy people for the Healthy People 2030 initiative. Let's focus for a second on the physical environment because that's really what I'm here to talk to you about. Um, the physical environment includes the structures and features around you, but it also includes nature's, nature and plants. So growing up green is what we're talking about, but what exactly does that mean? Well, green spaces are generally those with nature in them like trees or plants and sometimes grass. Um, these could be somewhere you go, like a community park, or it can be the amount of those natural features around where you live and work and go to school. Really what the best case scenario for green spaces is, is trees. So why is that? Trees filter groundwater through their root system. They filter air by trapping contaminants inside the leaves and roots and bark of a tree. They can help stabilize the ground on hillsides, decrease flooding and stabilize temperature, especially in areas with a lot of concrete that would retain heat. 
They provide habitat for birds, mammals, and insects. And science has found that having more animal species around is good for human health. Trees around the home can provide shade that decreases air conditioning use and saves on energy bills. And in large open areas like farms, trees can serve as a windbreak. They can also be noise or visual barriers between a home and a busy road or industrial area that you don't necessarily want to see. So how does nature inf influence our health? We found through research that time in nature can be beneficial for health. Many studies have shown that health benefits of nature include better physical health, like stronger hearts and lungs, and also better mental health, like less anxiety and depression. Natural settings have been found to improve attention, increase physical activity and decrease obesity, and mothers living in greener areas have found to ha been found to have healthier babies. Kids who spend time in natural settings show improved problem solving and thinking skills. They're better able to rebound from stress. They're better able to focus and regulate their emotions. They have increased imagination and creativity, and they develop better motor communication and decision-making skills. So now that science has shown us that there's a relationship and benefit to greenness, the next question we wanna figure out is why? There are a few pathways or mechanisms by which we think the relationship between nature and, and health might happen. There are three really widely accepted, and those include reducing harm, restoring capacities, and building capacities. Reducing harm is reducing exposure to air pollution, noise, and heat, those things that can be detrimental to health. Restoring capacities is nature's ability to improve attention and allow the mind and body to recover from stress. Building capacities happens by offering a place for physical activity or social interaction, those things that help us be healthier. So I'm gonna apply this to real life for a second. Um, you might notice the, recognize this if you're from the Bowling Green area. This is um, Circus Square Park. Now, disclosure, I'm not from Bowling Green, um, but I found this on Google Maps um, and um, it was a great illustration of um, a park. So what do you notice about this space? And I'm gonna pause for a second and Luz, if, if anybody has a comment, would you let me know? I sure will. I'm just interested when you look at the features of this space, what comes to your mind? Or if you've been there, I've never been there. My chat's a little quiet. Well, so that's okay. Somebody wrote, it's really uniform. Yeah, yeah, I, I noticed that too, that there's a lot of symmetry to it. Um, yeah, I, I think that's that's a big one. It's a um, big open area. It sure looks nice. Somebody is definitely taking care of it. Um, it looks well maintained, so it's, it, it's probably safe. I don't know the area, but um, if someone's putting that much care into it, it's probably pretty safe. Um, it looks like a good place to meet up with people, maybe catch a concert. Um, so there's a lot of socialization that probably is gonna happen. There are some trees. Uh, but they look pretty small, really. Um, there's a couple of big ones in there. Um, so um, there's some trees, but there's a lot of grass. Um, and I think grass is really interesting because when you think of a green space, you might think of grass, but as far as contributing to the environment, grass doesn't do nearly as much as trees would um, as far as those, those benefits we talked about. Um, so let's think back to those mechanisms. We had three mechanisms. Reducing harm. Um, how would this park reduce harm? Well, it's probably not giving a lot of um, air or temperature benefit necessarily. It's nice that the grass replaces possibly some concrete um, to make the area maybe not as warm, um, but that's probably a pretty small benefit. Um, 
that grass could help filter uh, water runoff. So when, if you have busy roads like these that are full of cars, when the rain comes through and washes them off um, frequently, that water runoff um, needs to be filtered before it's safe. And so that grass can help with that. Um, restoring capacities was our next one. And that was um, the benefits. So let's think about maybe stress recovery. So if you work or go to school um, in an area right near this park, maybe on your lunch break or after your classes are finished, you can go there and take a little walk and clear your mind. That could be restorative. Um, I think building capacities, um, there's definitely space for physical activity. There's, a, there's some paths. Um, I'm not sure how big those paths are. You might have to walk them several times to get a lot of physical activity. Um, but then definitely the big grassy areas can help with um, like sports, like maybe pick up football or um, throw a Frisbee or um, even take your dog if that's if that's legal there. So here's here's a contrast. Just a couple blocks away is Pioneer Cemetery. Um, this is also green space. Cemeteries are green space. What do you notice about this? My chat is quiet, but I think I'm noticing the trees look bigger in this one. Yeah, I see that too. Yeah, Peyton says way more trees. Way more trees, yeah. Um, so the the more trees is great. Um, I notice, what is that? Um, there's sort of a path that goes across, you know, sort of diagonal and and down, um, it's more free form. I think Beth said earlier that it was, the first one was very um, structured. This is a lot more free form. Um, there isn't quite the symmetry as the other one. Um, anything else? There's some grass, um, but um, definitely there's more trees. So let's think about mechanisms for this park because I think they're gonna be very different from the other park. Um, reducing harm, definitely the trees are gonna reduce more harm. They're gonna do more air filtering, more temperature stabilization. Um, the root system is gonna be better able to filter water than, e than even that big patch of grass in the other park. So that's definitely in this area. Um, Restoring capacities, is it peaceful? Is it beautiful? And could it, you know, could it reduce stress? It could, uh, but it's really gonna depend on how people feel about being in a cemetery. Um, for some people that would not be very restorative, um, but for some people it, it, they might just like the quiet. Um, building capacities, physical activity is probably limited to a short walk along this reform path. Um, socialization probably isn't happening at the cemetery. Um, there might be some benches, um, but those would be more solitary, I would imagine. Um, but some people really like having a quiet place to rest and reflect. Um, and for those people, this would really be capacity restoring. And thinking through those two spaces, you really see the differences. And when people say green space, they really can mean very different things. This is another example of a local park. It's called West End Neighborhood Park. And again, I'm not from Bowling Green, so I'm not familiar with these parks, but I found them and thought they were interesting. Um, there are trees behind this park, but I think those are probably more connected to the homes than part of the park. I think those are residential. Um, I would call this more of a recreational area for, small, for smaller children. Um, the small patch of grass isn't really giving any environmental benefit at all. Um, and it's, you know, the, the structure is there for play, um, but as far as trees and grass, it's pretty minimal. Um, I don't see this area being very useful for older children or teens. Um, hopefully it's safe. Um, it does provide a lot of act social interaction for potentially small children and their caregivers. 
Um, but the neighborhood would have to keep an eye on this area to make sure it doesn't become an area for um, violence or drugs as sometimes can happen in a community park. In contrast, this is the Chuck Kroon Nature Park. Um, this is another example of a non-structured area in Bowling Green. Um, there's definitely physical activity and restoration potential here. Um, you can see this path again is more free form like the cemetery was versus um, Circus Square Park. Um, some people find that structured geometry very beautiful and, and relaxing almost to have order around them. And some people find this more natural free form state restorative. So it's gonna work in different ways for different people, but both offer health benefits um, they just work by different mechanisms. So when we think about green space, there can be a lot of differences in what that means. Um, we can be talking about playgrounds, golf courses, nature preserves, vacant lots, um, cemeteries, and those spaces have vastly different features and benefits. So is a golf course green space that everyone can use? <laughs> Um, probably not. It's probably restricted. Um, Dr. Harris, I'm sorry. Um, I just want to interrupt because one of your one of your participants was reading your mind. Hadley wrote, "What do you think about things like golf courses, which can act like green space, but may also fracture a habitat?" So she was reading your mind. I just didn't want to yes. interrupt, but I thought that was great. Yes, that's a great that's a great thought. So. Um, you know, a golf course, um, and I'm not a golfer, but I've driven past many golf courses um, and looked at them by satellite. Um, they're generally grass. There are usually some trees, some, you know, stands of trees. Um, I think that you have to be careful because like I said, one of the questions, and I'm jumping ahead a little bit, but one of the questions I like to think about is what are the features of the space and who has access to it? So. If it's, um, it, if it's restorative to look at and you can afford to live next to it, maybe it's restorative to you. Um, but unfortunately, not everybody can afford access to, um, to a private golf course. There are public golf courses that people could access, but maybe you're like me and golf just isn't your game. So um, I think there are, there are benefits to it, um, but I think there are, more, there are other ways to use land that can have more benefit. But overall, my philosophy is we need a little bit of something for everyone. Some people really find that restorative. I personally don't. Um, so I would rather be in a nature preserve like the one we just saw. Um, so I think if you are not um, using that space for in lieu of um, someone else having space um, or maybe tearing down part of a forest um, to build this flat grass area, not necessarily flat, I guess they do have hills, but um, I think there are, there are environmental benefits and detriments depending on the context of where it is. Um, but in general, I'm not anti, um, anti golf courses at all. Um, so even playgrounds, you can think of what features are there, like the park we saw before? Is it really just a metal structure in the middle of um, maybe some, hopefully, let's say, recycled rubber mulch or something? Um, that may be fun for very small children, and it might give caregivers a chance to socialize, uh, but it's really not contributing anything to the environment. Um, versus if you have sort of more natural playscapes, which are starting to be more popular, um, and allow kids this sort of more um, creative exploration like we saw in the picture before, that those are the pieces that really increase creativity um, in industry and kids where they get to build things um, and then tear them down and nobody's yelling at them because it's outside. Um, so those are all ways to really think about um, how green spaces are important to the people who live near them and really who can benefit from them. Thank you for asking that question. So why does any of this matter? Um, a, a mentor of mine once said, who cares? Um, and that's a great question for scientists to always be asking themselves, who cares? 
Well, let's look specifically at Kentucky. Um, according to the United Health Foundation's America's Health Rankings, here are some um, trends in Kentucky as of last year, 2019. Um, strengths included high percentage of high school students who graduate, a low prevalence of excess drinking, a low crime rate, and the percentage of population without health insurance is decreasing. Challenges in Kentucky continue to be the high prevalence of physical inactivity, and probably hand in hand with that, obesity and diabetes are increasing, the, incur the occurrence of frequent mental distress is increasing, and there are high cancer death rates compared to the national averages. So now that we know all this information about greenness and how it can improve health, how can we apply that to the challenges in Kentucky? Um, so we know that nature is associated with increased physical activity. This can be increased even more through good trail systems, um, maybe urban um, bike paths, or um, actually it don't even have to be near urban. In Cincinnati, there's a bike path that goes over 200 miles from Cincinnati to Cleveland um, through the state of Ohio. So um, those, it goes through all kinds of areas. Um, people can do yoga classes and those sorts of things outside, outdoor sports facilities. Um, more ac physical activity would also address the climbing rates of uh, obesity and diabetes. Um, exercise by itself, even without nature, can lower stress. Um, so um, less vigorous but more peaceful time in nature and social connections through parks are also very good for mental health. So again, having a mixture of those things, you have areas for people to exercise, but you also have um, natural preserved areas where people can um, feel that connection. Um, cancer is sometimes caused by exposure to toxins in the air and ground and water supply. Um, those sources of exposure are improved by trees as they filter out contaminants. Um, so by having more parks and trees and natural spaces, we can address really each of these serious health challenges in Kentucky. Now, is nature a cure for cancer? Probably not. I haven't done the literature search, but I'm pretty sure it's not ironclad. Um, however, among an entire population, if you think a whole population, for example, in a county in Kentucky or in Kentucky itself, um, those with more green spaces probably will have um, more opportunity to be healthy than those who do not. So really, in conclusion, by getting to, into nature and we ensure all people have the opportunity to do so safely, uh, we can help optimize health across the lifespan. And that's what my work strives to do. So what can you do? This is, this is where I, I call upon you. Um, here are some things you can do in your own life. You can make an effort to get into nature. You can encourage your friends and family to go with you or get out themselves. Um, you can share what you've learned today and throughout your education about the importance of healthy green spaces. And you can maybe even out advocate for spending more time outdoors, for example, in your classes, having class outside, especially in this um, time if you're in person school. Um, I know people are getting outside for mask breaks. You can help your community by volunteering at nature centers, zoos, parks and botanical gardens. This is just one example. I'm not affiliated with the Louisville Zoo, but um, I know that they have a team program that provides opportunity for leadership um, development, community engagement, and contr contributing to conservation efforts. Um, and they also look really good on college applications, so that doesn't hurt. You can join or even organize your own community cleanup project to make green recreation areas appealing and safe especially for parks that maybe, um, maybe are neglected. And lastly, make sure you keep learning. You can look for foundations dedicated to the things you care about. Um, these are just examples of some, um, but certainly anything that you have a passion for, there's usually some national um, nonprofit associated with it and they would love your time and um, energy. So again, I want to thank Dr. Huntington Moskos for inviting me today. 
um, to speak with all of you, and I would really like to hear from you. Um, if you have any questions about this presentation that you think of later, or you're just shy and you don't want to ask them today, um, if there are questions about health and science in general, or if you want to talk about careers in those fields, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. Thank you.